uh, was on sulfur compounds. And one of the things we need to think about with sulfur compounds is oxidation state. So we talked a little bit about the difference. If we look at oxygen, oxygen really only has two. It has minus two, which is the standard, or minus one. If we think about minus two for oxygen, that's gonna be things like oxygen and water, um, oxygen and alcohol, oxygen in a ether, oxygen in a carbonyl, Right. All of these would be minus two uh, oxygen state. The minus one really only has to do with our peroxides. So we'd see that in, in hydrogen peroxide, um, an ether peroxide. You would also see that in the oxygens, these oxygens of a peroxy acid. But when we look at sulfur, we have a lot, we have a lot, right? So we have, with sulfur, we've got minus two, we've got minus one, we've got zero, plus two, plus four, and plus six. That's because of the hypervalent nature of sulfur. It's lower down, it has another, um, another uh, orbital shell. So we'll have to do this in a couple of rows, but minus two, that's our standard. That's gonna be our thiols. That's gonna be our sulfides. That's gonna be the sulfonic, sulfonium ions, which we'll look at one of those today. Minus one, like with the oxygens, is going to be our sulfide-sulfide bond. So this is like our disulfide. Zero is really elemental to sulfur, plus things like sulfoxides. And sulfenic acids. And this is elemental. Our plus two oxidation states, we add more oxygen to sulfur. So sulfur in the sulfone. We have a We can also have a sulfinic acid. So notice um, I should probably be a little clearer on my type, my writing here. Sulfinic and sulfinic. So that one's got an I and this one has an E. We look at plus four oxidation states. We've got sulfur dioxide. Little sulfonic acids. And we'll see some of these next semester. Sulfite esters a layer a little rarer at least in in organic chemistry and our plus six this is going to be our sulfonate esters so sulfur trioxide and our sulfonate esters. And our sulfonate esters, we've seen those um,
in activation. If we look at these, um, there's a lot on this. So let's kind of point out the ones that you know. Of course, the minus two, the thiols, the sulfides, and the sulfonic ions, you'll need to know those. Disulfides, we looked at those last week, right? So that's the oxidation. Sulfoxides, we're going to look at today. Sulfones, we'll look at today. Sulfonic acids, we'll see a little bit later, and then the sulfonate esters. So of these, the ones that you're going to see in organic chemistry are going to be the ones I underlined with blue. Okay, we have a question about the final exam. The final exam is comprehensive. Um, it's probably going to have a little bit more uh, on the last portion. Uh, so think maybe a third of the test will be over the last portion that wasn't on the last exam. But then uh, the rest of the exam will cover uh, all of the all of the class, so it is going to be a comprehensive final exam. Okay. All right. So one of the things with the sulfonate, uh, the oxidation is then we can look at oxidation of these, right? So it turns out we can take sulfides and oxidize those. Um, to other derivatives. So if we take a sulfide, we can oxidize that first to a sulfide. And then we can oxidize that again to the sulfone. For the oxidation of the thiol, and let's go ahead and put a derivative here. You might as well use one that you're going to see again and again. So let's do the methyl. Okay. If we use a somewhat mild oxidant, so hydrogen peroxide at room temperature, we can end up with uh, the sulfoxide. If we look at this one, this is dimethyl sulfide. So the naming is much like the ethers, right? So this would be dimethyl ether, dimethyl sulfide. And then this one is dimethyl sulfoxide. Or known as DMSO, right? So that's our solvent. We can also oxidize these with a little stronger acid, I mean oxidant, like the peroxy acids to get the sulfone. Okay, and over here, notice either of those, so we can start either with the sulfide or the sulfoxide. This is a peroxy acid. So any of the proxy acids will give us the sulfone. And this one would be the dimethyl sulfone. Okay. And we're not going to cover the, the mechanism on, on these oxidations. Okay, we're going to step back and catch a reaction for thiols. So thiols are pretty straightforward to make, right? So if we take we can take a
a uh, electrophile such as this um, propyl bromine and then react that with the sulfur compound, right? So this, this uh, deprotonated hydrogen sulfide to give us the thiol. Now, it's also possible because of the nucleophilicity of the thiol that this reaction would continue to give us uh, the sulfide. So usually when we do this synthesis, we're usually careful about how we add these two reagents. Um, adding uh, a low concentration of the thiol to a high concentration of the bromide. Um, that way we can, we can get the reaction to, to, to stop. So, so the way we do the reaction can make sure that we get the thiol. So this is um, a side product. If we do it well, if we do our, our additions correctly, we'll just get a little bit of this. So this is a, a possible problem. To take care of this possible problem, especially in reagents where um, your substrate is quite um, complicated or expensive to make. In this case, you know, if you got a little bit of that side product, um, that undesirable product, it probably wouldn't be a problem. But if we had spent a lot of time building our bromide, then, then that would be um, problematic. Um, and so we would want to um, look at those. Uh, we want a better way to do that. So the way we can do that is uh, thiols, uh, thiol synthesis. with thiourea. So we take our bromide. This time we react it with thiourea, which is this compound. We'll look at the mechanism in just a minute and then follow that with water and base to do hydrolysis. So the mechanism on this one, thiourea is this compound we get a nucleophilic SN2 style reaction. Right? So we get a backside attack, kicks that off. That ends up giving us the sulfur. I'm sorry, I've been drawing the wrong number of nitrogens. I mean, hydrogen is all my nitrogen. So let's fix that. All right, so now we've added the sulfur, so we've made the carbon, the uh, sulfur oxygen bond. Okay, so we've made this carbon sulfur bond here. So therefore we're going next step is just hydrolysis. So that's gonna be water and sodium hydroxide. which gives us um, this plus urea um, as the other product. So the advantage of this one is that we're only gonna get a single addition. We're gonna end up with thiols, but we're not gonna end up with any, any sulfides. That's because at this point, you know, once we've made to that carbon sulfur bond, we have a sulfur positive, which is electrophilic and not nucleophilic. So this is not gonna react with another equivalent of that. Okay, again, in this specific example, there's probably no reason to use this over this, but if you had a large uh, complicated bromide or electrophile, you'd probably want to go ahead and use the thiourea. It's a pretty straightforward reaction. 
Okay, any questions about those? Give you time to type. So let's look at sulfonic, sulfonium salts. So the sulfonium salts, we have the CH3. So we can take this and react it with something like methyl iodide. This will create a sulfonium salt. This is an SN2 type reaction. The, th the sulfonium salts aren't overly stable, um, but they can be used under uh, specific reagents. They do have a biological um, a utility. Uh, to show what the utility of the sulfonic salt esters, we have to think about methylation. So if we th think about something like, uh, You know, so methoxide. Just use a generic. Potentially, we could have something like the methyl iodide reacting, but the oxygen is not overly nucleophilic in this position. Okay, this is not a great methylate agent. This would be a slow reaction. You know, we could speed it up by adding pyridine, a few things like that, but it, it's not an overly, uh, uh, reactive reagent with the methyl iodide. Methyl iodide is pretty stable. We can change that by adding a methylating agent and the sulfonic salts are methylating type agents. So what we have here is the lone pair then reacts, reacts with the carbon right? and this becomes what we refer to as a methylating agent. The reaction is a little faster, right? Often we'll get that proton transfer. And the reason it's faster is that this is more reactive. Right, you wouldn't make the sulfonic salt and just leave it around, right? You would want to um, react it pretty quickly. Okay, so that's that's if we we're talking about in a bottle, but in a biological system, uh, we're going to be looking at uh, SAM as a methylating agent. So SAM is S. S 
pattern of cell methion and that's this rather large molecule and we're just getting started so we have a uh, ribonose over here there's our sulfur And we're showing that in the biological system. So we're showing it with the oxygen negative and the nitrogen positive there. Oh, and I forgot uh, positive on there. So this is our sulfur, that's our methyl. So this is gonna be used for methyl transfers. Notice that it's it looks very biological. We have a ribonose uh, here. Um, we have uh, a base pair um, type moiety here. So if we look at, at this portion here, you can already see that this is this looks like an RNA or a DNA, in this case an RNA, but an RNA or DNA type, type system. So it is used for that. So it's used for a couple of things. One of them is to methylate um, uh, DNA uh, base pairs. And so, um, we won't, so we don't have to redraw the, the uh, SAM here. What I'll do is I'll draw the base pair down here. Okay, so if we have a DNA strand here, here is a, a base pair. Um, and again, in the enzyme, we would have um, several different things uh, available to us. One of those being um, in an enzyme, right, is protein. So we can have uh, ASP protein, right? So we've got a protein, this is from the enzyme. So this portion here is from the enzyme, but what it does is it gives us a base. And what's happening in the methylation here is that we're getting, you know, deprotonation, right? Methylation, so that's going to detect that. And then electrons going back to the sulfur to change, to neutralize the sulfur. And I'm not going to redraw all of this. I'm just going to redraw this portion. All right, so now we have lone pair there. We've got our nitrogen with the methyl attached. So we now methylated. Plus then our enzyme the protein here. Okay. So this is our, our SAM unit. So that's going to be our methylating agent. methylating agent, right? This is our enzyme. So this is all occurring, you know, in an enzyme. So you can think about an enzyme that's 
trailing down the DNA. It's going to modify this base pair here. So then this deprotonates, electrons go over to attack the, the carbon, the methylating carbon, and then our lone pair, our electrons go back up to the sulfur. That ends up methylating this base pair, right? This is the rest of our group up here. And we have the protonated, protonated enzyme here. Okay. So this is a biological uh, O2. So this right here, that's just a minus. So the question was, what is connected to the O2 on the SAM? And that's just a minus. So if we think about this, this is an amino acid. So an amino acid would normally be NH2 with the H. Here though, we have the, the, the two. We, it's in a biological system, so we're getting the zitterion. Okay. So methylating, this is, a, this is a, a desired methylating agent. So this is something that, uh, that would happen um, in a known process. Chemists made uh, methylating agents. One of them was called supermethyl. The problem with um, non-biological methylating agents is they will methylate um, and usually pretty readily. So uh, chemists trying to make synthetic viable products made something called supermethyl. The supermethyl was a great sulfonating, uh, methylating agent. Problem with it is, is that it would methylate base pairs. So if you absorb some through your skin, um, while you were in the lab, you potentially would have this methylating agent and it would methylate anything. So if it did get to DNA, um, it would methylate DNA, but randomly. And then of course that causes cancer. So this is a very specific methylating agent. You might read that methylating agents can be ca cause cancer. Those would be those that are not biologically uh, determined or reactive. So methylating agents um, that would be absorbed or consumed can be problematic. Now, most of those are no longer used in organic chemistry, like super sulfur hasn't been, a super methylating agent hasn't been used since the early 80s. Um, so they haven't been around for, for quite some time. But in this case, the SAM is a biologically uh, important uh, methylating uh, agent that you should be aware of. Okay. Questions about SAM or this methylation process? Besides DNA pairs, you'll see other biological uses for SAM. SAM is not only used for methylating DNA, it can also be used for methylating other groups. So if you see SAM, uh, you know, capital S-A-M um, and enzyme, so let's say a way you might see this reaction would be, let's say we were taking something like this. Some R group over here, imagine that's biological, and it says something like SAM. Well, I got to put SAM. Uh, SAM. All right, this is our, that's, that would be our methylating agent. So the SAM, usually in an enzyme, right, is going to be our. our our product. Okay. Any questions about this one? Okay. So when we were doing conjugated dienes, uh, we didn't look at addition. We looked at stability, we did a couple other things, but if we're thinking about dienes, right, these are conjugated dienes. So if I look at this, I've got a P orbital here, right, I can draw a continuous pi system. If I added a hydrogen,
right, so if I added a hydrogen here, that give me a carbocation here. Right, and then that has resonance. To this one, right? So we looked at the conjugated uh, dienes, but it, we didn't talk about what happens when you do an addition. So we're backing up a little bit to pick this up before we uh, finish out, uh, before we move on to phosphorylations on Thursday. Yeah. So if we have this reaction and we react, react it with um, HBr, okay, what's what's going to be happening? So let's let's look at the mechanism. So nucleophile is going to take that at proton, right? So we're going to get a proton transfer, nucleophile to electrophile. That's going to end up giving us the hydrogen here and the positive there, right? So that's one. But we also know that then that can delocalize to give us the proton there, I mean, the positive there. So we have these two different um, groups. Now then the bromide can potentially go and react at either of these two positions. So the bromide could attack this position, giving us this product, right? Or it could have attacked this position to give us, and I'm leaving the bromine or the hydrogen on there on purpose, okay, to give us this. Now, if we look at these two, um, if we look at where the hydrogen add is one, this is gonna be a one, two, so this would be known as our one, two addition product or addict. Here, if we look at that as one, two, three, four, this is our one, four addition product. Okay. So both of these are possible, but what, which one is going to be um, favored? Well, it turns out if we change our conditions, we can get two different products. So if we look at this one, HBr at minus 80 degrees, we end up getting a majority of the one, two addition. And again, I'm leaving the hydrogen on there to so you can help recognize the one, two, and the one, four. So under cold conditions, okay, we end up with a majority of the one, two. Then if we heat this up, let's see. And again, I'm leaving the hydrogen on there just to help out for right now. We can get a shift in that where the one, one, four product is fair. Okay, 
hot or warm. Okay. Okay, so we have two different conditions, right? That give us two different products. This first one is known as kinetic control. The second one is known as thermodynamic. In kinetic control, it's going to be how fast? And if we think about a one, two addition, think about the process of this addition, right? So let's think about what's going on here for the one, two addition. So we've got our double bond. We have our HBr. This goes out there. Right, and we get this. And our bromine is right here, right? So if we think about what's going on here, our bromine is right there next to that positive charge, okay? This can delocalize, but that bromine could also react with that before we get that delocalization to occur. So if I can get this reaction to occur quickly, right, then that this is going to be the process, right? So change that color, right? This is going to be the one to addition. If we think about thermodynamic, right, what thermodynamic is looking for is how stable. Right, it's looking for the lowest energy possibility, right? And it's looking at the stability of the product. Right, if we think about how fast, we're really thinking about the transition state. So in the case of kinetic, we're thinking about speed. And so a lower transition state is gonna give us the product. In thermodynamics, we're looking at stability, right? And what we want to do in uh, thermodynamics is we want to have, what we wanna do is put enough energy into the system so that this equilibrium, right? And we usually show it with a double bar of the arrows, right? But it is an equilibrium. We want this process to have enough time and enough energy, right? To go to the more stable. And why is this more stable? Well, it turns out it has to do with the double bond. If we think about the carbocation, the carbocation is actually uh, going to be going back and forth, right? And so the more stable, what we're looking at is the more substituted then will result when we add our bromine to give us the more stable product. And again, I'm just adding the H here to be clear on the one four. So higher energy, heat, right, is going to is going to increase the equilibrium. So in in general, right, this is kinetic is going to be speed, right, transition state. How fast can we get the reaction to occur? The one that occurs fastest is going to be kinetically product. Thermodynamic is going to look at the stability. So we usually want equilibrium 
So kinetic, we can think also about quantitative. You want it to occur and then stop. Thermodynamic, you want it to go through equilibrium. So you'll see this idea of kinetic versus thermodynamic uh, several more times this year. So the thing to think about that is kinetic is going to be what's going to happen fastest. In this case, a 1-2 addition is always going to be the kinetic because the bromine is close to that. So therefore, this really has to do with uh, spatial arrangement. right? So 1-2 is the kinetic product because of the, of the proximity. So if I can cool this down enough to where the transition state and the transition state here is going to be faster because the bromine is closer in proximity, I'm going to get a one two addition. So in addition to dienes, the one two addition is the kinetic product. It's a little bit more complicated with the thermodynamic product. The thermodynamic product is going to be the more stable product. That may be the one four, but it also may be the one two. There are cases where the one two and the one four are both the kinetic and thermodynamic product. And so in this case, you're really asking yourself, what is the more stable product, right? And in this case, it's the more substituted double bond. I have a question. Mm -hmm. How do you know exactly the percentage? The what? Uh, percentage, like- Oh, the you're- you're not going to know the percentage. Okay. Yeah, that's that's going to be an experimental. What I would be asking you for is what is the major product? So which one would be the higher percentage? Okay. So if the, if the conditions were uh, kinetic, so cold uh, type conditions, then that would be my one to addition would be in pro would be the st the product. If it was uh, equilibrium or a higher temperature than my thermodynamic product. And notice I didn't say one four, I said thermodynamic. So that would be the most stable product. So you're not gonna be asked for the percentages. You may be provided the percentages, but you won't be expected to give them. Those are experimentally determined values. Okay, okay. thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's look and see what this would look like in a, in a problem. So let's look at a couple and here, um, And again, give me the majority product. Okay, so show me both products. And then identify which one is the, is the major product. Take a couple minutes.
I'm going to go ahead and start with the mechanism. Both of these are the same. I did that on purpose. So we can use the mechanism for both. So, you know, the first thing we do is get addition of the hydrogen. It gives me the carbocation. Okay. And then that can do resonance. Then my homine can come in. So bromine attacks the carbocation. And that gives me my one, two. So let's transpose those up here. So our two products are going to be the one, two product. And the one, four product. And down here, we can do the same thing. All right. Yes, there's only two double bonds in the reactant. Did I draw three? No. So it's not an aromatic. It's just it's just a diene. So the question was, are there two, more than two double bonds? So, so we do. If it was an aromatic, this reaction wouldn't occur this way. And we'll get there. You'll get the aromatic reactions next semester. Okay. So then the question. So that's the way I would do it. First, I would go ahead and work through the mechanism, come up with the two possible products. And then I would ask myself, okay, so is this kinetic or is it thermodynamic? In this top one, 100 degrees Celsius, it's boiling water, right? So that's thermodynamic. Right? So thermodynamic is telling me what? Okay, it's telling me the stability of the product. Okay, and that's that's what it's telling me. Now, for additions to diene, which stability of the product are we talking about? Where we're talking about the, pro the stability of our alkene, right? So it's the substitution of our alkene. So that's what we need to do, right? Is figure out which is the more stable alkene. So when we're looking at these two, right? I have this alkene and this alkene, this here, right, is the one, two addition. This is the one, four addition. But which of these two double bonds is more stable? Well, this is a three substituted double bond, right? So if we look at this double bond right here, I have one, two, three carbons attached. This double bond over here is just two substituted. Right. So if we look at it, right, I just have one, two. So if we're looking at this double bond, which of those two is going to be the more stable? The three substituted. So which one is the thermodynamic product? The first one. So here's an example based on the structure, right? Where the thermodynamic product is the one, two. Okay, so don't assume that the thermodynamic product is always one, four. That's the major mistake students make in this area, right? Thermodynamic is can be one, two or can be one, four. It has to do with the stability of the product and what you're looking for is the stability of the alkene. Okay, so the three substitute is more stable. That makes the one, two addition my uh, major product. Now let's go to the next one. Here we've got it cold, right? So that tells me it's kinetic, right? So that's fast, right? And in this type of reaction, what does that mean? That means one, two. So which of these is my one, two? 
Well, this first one is the one two, right? This is the one four. How do I know what the one four is? Watch for a movement in the double bond, right? If the double bonds move, that means it's been resonance. That's going to be your one four. Your one two is going to be direct addition to one of those double bonds, right? So therefore, this is my major product, okay? So with this substrate, right, both my thermodynamic and my kinetic both give me the same major product, the majority product, okay? And that's because of the stability of the one, two over the one, four based on the substitution of my diene. All right, so it's just, so kinetic, pretty straightforward, one, two, right? You're adding that bromine without allowing it to do any resonance first. For thermodynamics, you've got to check your alkene to see which product is the most stable. All right. There's a couple of other things with the dienes. Um, probably not, we're not going to cover those. Uh, they are called diels alder reactions. I usually put those with paracyclic reactions. Um, paracyclic reactions usually are an organic too. So I'm not gonna move into those, but it is important for you to understand thermodynamic and the kinetic and be able to distinguish those two with addition of um, addition to alkene. Now, some of, some of the alkene reactions um, don't really go through this. Uh, so hydroboration, oxidation, we get the boron and the hydrogen added at the same time. So we don't really get that product, but bromination would. So there's some reactions where you're getting addition of both groups at exactly the same time, not going through a carbocation. So the thought here is if I go through a carbocation, right? If I'm going through a carbocation, then I have both kinetic and thermodynamic. If I'm going through a, a, a concerted addition, like in hydroboration oxidation, then I'm at always doing one, two. I don't have a carbocation. I'm not going to get a one, four. Okay. All right. Let's do a few practice problems and we'll call it a day. So let's try these three, provide the products. Okay. Let's go ahead and take a look. So in the first one, remember that we are adding the, the thiourea to make B1. 
this sulfur compound and then we're hydrolyzing that to thiol. So this is just a way to make a thiol without any secondary sulfide reactions. Okay. The second one, SAM with an enzyme is a methylating agent. We look for our methylating group. Here we have the nitrogen. Again, these are most often biological systems. And again, here, if it's a big group like this, you're looking for an oxygen or nitrogen for your methylating group, right? So in here, I put an R because these are usually biological, but what we're looking for is nitrogen or oxygen. That's where I'm gonna be methylating. Okay, the last one, we have a sulfide. Sulfide in a mild oxidant is gonna end up with a sulfoxide. Oops. So we just oxidize up to the sulfoxide. Okay. Questions about this one? I kind of have one. So why does sulfide there's not has a charge on this last uh, example? The last example? because I'm actually changing the oxidation level of the sulfur. Okay. So if, if it had been, so let's say it was oxygen, oxygen only has two oxidation states, mm -hmm. right? So if we go, if we go back to um, here, right? We only have two oxidation states. So if it doesn't fit into one of these two oxidation states, mm -hmm. then I have, then I'm gonna have a charge. Okay. If we look at sulfur, I have multiple oxidation states. It's part of the hypervalent nature of sulfur, part of the fact that it has another um, orbital ring. Um, uh, so that here I have all of these possibilities, right? And so whenever I oxidize that sulfur, I don't have the charges. So when I go from the sulfide to the sulfoxide, I'm changing the oxidation, the actual oxidation state of the oxygen. If we look here for the sulfonium uh, ion, I haven't changed the oxidation state. I'm just adding another group. I do have the positive charge. Okay, the got it now. The difference is you have all of these oxidation levels in sulfur. So you, you only see those charges when you're staying within an oxidation level. Okay, thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. And again, sulfur, phosphorus are the ones that you're going to see most of that have lots of oxidation levels. Most of the things you deal with don't. So nitrogen doesn't really. Carbon only has a couple, right? Nitrogen only have a couple. Oxygen only have a, only has a couple, right? So you only see it in those. So let's look at uh, pick reagents. Um, So let's pick the best reagents for these three reactions.
Okay, let's go ahead and take a look. Okay, in this first one, um, we have the disulfide, right? And we're going to the thiol. So what we need is a mild reducing agent. Okay, and the one that we can use something like zinc and acid would be fine. Okay, so all we need there is a mild reducing agent. If you just put mild reducing agent for now, that's fine. The one ones you want to look at are are like tin and acid, zinc and acid. Usually, a metal and acid uh, will do this. Uh, there's other mild reducing agents that can do this. Biologically, there's there's FAD to FAD plus. Um, so, but here, if you put mild reducing agent, um, that'd be good. If not, you wanna look for reducing agents. Um, reducing agents, metal and acid is, is a common reducing agent. What you wouldn't put here on a multiple choice test would be things with oxygen. So you wouldn't put hydrogen peroxide, you wouldn't put a peroxy acid and so forth, okay? Okay, the next one, we need a oxidizing agent. And here we need a stronger oxidizing agent. So here we're gonna use our peroxy acid. Okay, so we use our peroxy acid to go to the sulfone. Okay. Again, make some more flashcards, uh, we'll look at these. In this case, the bottom one, right, now we have addition. So we know we have HBr, right? But that's not enough to get us the difference between these two. If we look here, this is the one, two. This is the one, four, right? Um, both of these are actually the same stability. But if we want to get the, the, the thermo, thermodynamic product would be both. Right? Why is it both? Well, they're both die substituted, right? So stability be both. But if we want the one, two, that's our kinetic. And how do we get kinetic? Kinetic, we don't want to drive the equilibrium. We want it to react and stop. So we do a, a, a lower temperature. And here, anything that signifies as a lower temperature, if you put zero degrees Celsius, if you put minus 60, minus 78, anything that's signifying that I know that I want to do a kinetic control reaction is going to be here. Minus 78 is the temperature of dry ice and acetone. And that's a that's a common um, reagent. Minus 20 is uh, salt in ice. Um, and of course, zero is 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 uh, is ice. So you have a few common temperatures here. But um, what you want to look for is something that signifies that you're trying to get the reaction to stop and not go through the equilibrium process. The equilibrium will give us. Okay, so where you want to look at is if, so the question is, how do you know the difference? So wherever I add my hydrogen, right? So notice I must have added my hydrogen here. I must have added my hydrogen there. So therefore that's one, two, three, four, one, two. So where did you add your hydrogen, right? And by definition, you're always going to add your hydrogen on the outside. So that's an important thing to, to talk about, right? So that I'm always going to add my hydrogen here or here, right? I'm not going to add my hydrogen here or here, right? That's because by adding it, and I always want to do a zigzag, Um, by adding it here, right, that gets me equilibrium. But if I add it in the middle, I don't, right? So it has to add to the outside. But you're really looking at where do you add your hydrogen and then where is the bromine added? So that's where the one, two. So here's one, two. Here it's one, two, three, four. Okay. Does that help? The reason I kept putting up here, kept putting the H's in there is to help you with that. Uh, but that's not going to be shown in your products. Okay, so you'll have to you'll have to look at those. Okay. So always think about where did I have my hydrogen? That's your one. And then where's the other group added? That's going to be your two. And again, thermodynamic, you have to make a decision about what's your most stable. But with kinetic, it's going to be one, two. It has to do with proximity. Okay. All right, 